Hello, I'm Robert McGee, Executive Director for the Engineering Society of Detroit, and I'm a proud supporter and sponsor of Campus Party Digital Edition. For 125 years, our society has promoted engineering excellence and innovation. From the rise of the auto industry to the fourth industrial revolution we are experiencing today. Through it all, engineering and technology leaders in Michigan, the state that employs more engineers per capita than any other, have been at the center of our progress. This summer, you have the opportunity to get a taste of Campus Party virtual digital experience. And next summer, the live experience will be held in Detroit in the summer of 2021. Michigan is home to 22 colleges and universities with A Better Engineering programs. We hope you will join us. to Campus Party's Reboot the World, the first ever digital edition. We are excited to have Terry Bean, founder of TriBean, with us this morning to present Try Being Exceptional at Networking. So over to you, Terry. All right, what's going on, people? Welcome to the great city of Detroit. Virtually, of course, we're gonna hook this up. We're gonna have a nice little conversation about how you can get better at networking. I'm excited to be able to facilitate this discussion and I'm looking forward to sharing some real good takeaways for you. So without further ado, let me open this up and make sure that this is going. Let's see it right here, right now. Here we go, people. Lovely little city, Detroit, just about, uh, you know, 700,000 of your favorite people hanging out there. So try being exceptional at networking. That's it. So what we're going to cover today, we've got these topics for you. Um, kind of running through the 12 greatest hits that I've uncovered over the 24 period, 24 years of teaching networking, running networking groups, helping people just be better connected in general. Uh, claim the fame Motor City Connect, a large business networking group here in the Detroit area with thousands of members in it. Producer of TEDx Detroit, an event that sees three to 4,000 people show up for a day of ideas worth spreading um, and some other really cool stuff too. But enough about me. Let's talk about why you're here. Ultimately, my belief is this. If we can all get better at networking, all of our networking will be better, right? It's just that simple. And like everything, it takes just a little bit of practice I'm going to show you some ideas on where to dig. Before we get too deep into it, I figure I best start out with what I define as networking. What do I think of it as? So we can kind of have the same page. So let's start. My first definition is three words. And if you visit MotorCityConnect.com, you'll see those three words on the site prominently. Those words are meet, understand, and connect. Listen, if you're not meeting new people and meeting the people you already know, you're not really networking. If you don't take the time to understand their needs while making sure they understand yours too, you're not really networking. And connect is so important that it's actually got three things coming at you. Number one, if you and I don't make some kind of connection where I care about you and your success and you care about me and mine, we're probably not going to network all that effectively. Secondly, if I don't take the time to understand or think about or contemplate or most importantly, believe that we as a people are already all connected from a spiritual and a universal perspective, we're probably not going to be that effective at networking. And finally, and this might be the most important of the three, 
if I don't take the time to connect you, like physically make the introduction to the people or the ideas or the companies that I know you need to meet, if I'm not making those type of connections for you, or you're not doing the same for me, we're probably not networking. So that's the long definition, meet, understand, connect. The significantly shorter definition is networking to me is leveraging the relationships you have to create the relationships you need. It's pretty straightforward. I know a lot of people talk about, oh, we shouldn't leverage people. Well, leverage uh, throughout the known world, leverage is the way movement happens. So if you want progress, you probably need to leverage something. And those relationships you have are a great thing to start with. So We've got the groundwork. We know what networking is, at least as far as I'm concerned. We can move on from here. My number one rule of networking, right? The first thing, the most important thing. I used to tell people all the time it was show up. But you know what? It's not enough to show up anymore in 2020. Now we've got these mobile phones that are tied to us. And it's really, really hard for us to be present because we're so curious and interested in what's going on outside of the four walls that we're in. So no longer can you show just show up. You have to show up and you have to be present. You have to be there. You have to be with the people. You have to be in the conversation because networking happens at the speed of light. It moves super quickly. So if you're not there, you're not ready for it. You're not paying attention. You could miss a perfect opportunity to make one of those connections that we talked about. So you have to be attentive. You have to pay attention. You have to be just kind of dialed in. And then one of the rules that I live by is this idea from Stephen Covey and his seven, uh, seven habits of highly successful people. He talked about the idea, seek first to understand before being understood. If you read some of the profiles I have on the web and have had for years, there's a couple of them that say my superpower is being able to listen to anybody for five minutes without interrupting. Or I talk about the idea that if we meet for the first time and we talk for 10 minutes, you're going to talk for eight and a half of those. And you're going to walk away feeling like the I'm the best conversationalist you've ever met. Why? Because everybody likes talking about their own favorite topic and everybody's favorite topic is themselves. So let them talk. And we'll cover that a little bit more in a section called after you networking. So number one rule, you got to be present, not enough to show up. You actually got to be present. So what should you do while you're there? Listen here. People, <laughs> I want you to understand this. There is a difference between hearing and listening. Hearing is a physiological process. If I say to my wife while I'm watching a football game, I hear you, that means to her, because she knows me and I'm pretty open and honest, that means, yep, I made some sounds. He knows I made some sounds. That does not mean he has any idea what I said right? Because hearing is physiological. It doesn't necessarily involve the ability to process information. And that's what listening means. Listening means your brain is as engaged as your ears are. You're actually running that information, that content through some processing power and coming up with shared meaning hopefully. So here's three ways to create shared meaning. Well, two anyway. Number one, active listening. Active listening is really, really important when you're talking to someone, they've got a lot of big ideas that they want to share, and you want to make sure that you understand them, and they want to make sure they're understood too. So I'll give you an example. I just said, oh, and the, and the way you do that is basically to rephrase what the important parts were, what the key words were. And you know, it's almost like you're parroting them. So for me, I'd be like, oh, so active listening, I kind of parrot what you just said and feed it back to make sure I have the right understanding. Yes, Terry Bean, that is exactly what ag active listening is. Good job. So that's active listening. Really, really important skill. 
use that one frequently when you're trying to get information from someone and make sure that you understand. Number two, critical listening. Critical listening is the idea that you're taking the main concepts, the big ideas, the main thought in a, in a paragraph or in a statement or what have you. So for me, I would be like, oh, so it's just like the highlights? Yes, that's exactly what critical listening is. So you have a better understanding. I'm trying to break it down a little bit for you. The last one is empathetic listening. And this is the stuff that psychologists and psychiatrists do in anybody that's in a social worker kind of role where you're trying to show that you're paying attention to what's being said and that you care about the person who is speaking because ultimately that's what we need more of today. We need more people who care about others. Yay. So anyway, empathetic listening. Great things to master and get really, really good of, good at. And you do that by practicing. Yes, it might feel a little weird the first couple of times. And it might sound a little weird to the people you're talking to. But I promise the clarity you'll get in conversation will be well worth it. All right, moving on, talking about when we go networking, before we even show up, we absolutely have to know what we have to offer, right? We have to be able to tell people what we can give to them. Networking isn't just about what can I get, what can I get, what can I get? Networking has to be about what can I give? Because the more we give, the more likely we are to get in return. So give you some thoughts here. You have a network, you have people in that network, you have the ability to make connections to those people in that network. You have a specific knowledge base, you've gained information over your lifetime and experiences, right? And even if you're 20 years old, those experiences are gonna be unique compared to someone who's 50 years old or 70. You're gonna have a different level of understanding and know things they don't know. So you have that, you've got time. You may have a strong back and the ability to move stuff. You've got energy and effort and the ability to show up and make a difference. Maybe you are talented with art and can create graphics or you write well or you speak well. Whatever the case may be, you have a unique set of talents that are yours, not necessarily yours alone, but are definitely yours. You can give those too right? And most importantly, you can give attention. You can give help whenever you can. We've got a lot of things to give, and it's really, really important that we take inventory of what we have to offer. Because as I said earlier, networking happens quickly. I'm not saying you can help everybody, but it's really easy to help those who you're destined to be able to help. You just have to be dialed into it and believe that you can. So know what you have to offer. Number two, on the flip side, know what you're trying to get. What is a gift for you? What are you looking for? Who are the people? What are the ideas? What are the companies that if someone could introduce you to would absolutely make your month rock? What? do you need to grow, right? What do you need to find success? Whatever it is, the clearer you are, the better off you're going to be. And let me explain that a little deeper. I talk about this all the stinking time. We talk about in Motor City Connect meetings, we don't do 60 second commercials or elevator pitches. We have what we call the ask. And the ask is very sincere, it's very quick, and it's very easy to do. I'll tell you, it's about 15 seconds and it consists of the following, your name, your business name, and your business category. Hey, I'm Terry Bean. I'm a business coach and professional speaker with trybean.com, right? That's about five seconds, maybe four, right? Depending if I said it quickly. Hey, I'm Terry Bean, professional coach and speaker at, with trybean.com. I screwed it up two times in a row. That's always fun. Uh, I'm so nervous. Do I sound nervous? I'm super nervous. I'm just kidding. I'm not really nervous. Um, but what I am is interested in making sure that you understand that that session section is about four seconds long. Name, business name, business category. And then 
who's the one person or the one company or the one big idea that if somebody in the room or somebody in the Zoom could introduce you to would absolutely make your month, right? So, hey, I'm Terry Bean. I'm a business coach and professional speaker with TryBean.com. I am looking to talk to sales managers who know that networking needs to be better in their organization. Boom, done, foop. So I've told you that I do some coaching, I do some speaking, I told you that I want to do some networking training or just having conversations with sales managers. Now that could be sales directors and that could be people that are here in the Detroit area or that could be here people that are in Minneapolis or in Memphis or Miami or Madagascar. It doesn't really matter to me. I love having that conversation. But what you'll note is I did it concisely right? That was 13 seconds tops. I was specific. And sometimes if I'm talking to people in a room in the Detroit area, I'll pick a specific company. And if I know the person who's the manager, because I can go look them up on LinkedIn, I'll actually use their name. Most importantly, I'll be real clear about it. One other thing that should be up here is confident. You should sound like you deserve to talk to that person, right? Like it's going to be to their benefit that that introduction gets made. Not just your benefit, but their benefit too. So practice, get good at it. Your ask should change. The more specific you are, the more likely you are to get what you're asking for. I know that's counterintuitive, but it's true because of the way we frame our people in our mind, we think about them in different sets of context. So the more specific you get, the easier it is. The, what's the worst thing is I'm looking for anyone or anybody who does this. As soon as people hear anyone or anybody, their brain shuts down. Think about it this way. You are playing a game of go fish with people's mental Rolodex. You want them scrolling through, looking at all the little cards in the Rolodex and picking out the one that is right for you. If you ask for anybody, you're basically asking for everybody. And if you do that, it doesn't matter how cool you are and how nice you are. You're not getting all the people they know. It's just not going to happen. So the next thing that's important about your messaging, right? And that's what your ask is. It might as well be part of your social media plan in your program. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about online networking in a minute. But the next thing you need to consider is why do people care? If you're not addressing this and letting people know why they care, guess what? They won't. For years, we've talked about the idea that content is king. You know what? That's over. Content just got overthrown, man. It got, there was a big coup and content lost and context came in and kicked content's butt off of the throne. Context is what matters. Having context around why people should care becomes a must in this day and age. So make sure that you're addressing that too. I'm going to talk about kind of a concept that might be a little foreign to you. It's the idea of relationship capital. I want you to think about when we talk about capital, we all often talk about money, right? We talk about finance and relationship capital is very, very similar. I want you to think about your network as your account, right? Like your bank account. In the way this works is the more deposits you put into your relationship capital, the more withdrawals you can make. A deposit is a lead, is a referral, is a connection, is an introduction, is a favor, is something you did nice for somebody else. Those are all deposits. An ask is to some extent a bit of a withdrawal, depending on, on how specific or how challenging that ask is. I get people that ask me to meet people in government or, you know, the celebrity type folk or big business owners in the area with some frequency. And you got to kind of earn that, right? Don't call me and ask me to meet Dan Gilbert, who's the guy that basically is renowned for saving the city of Detroit. That's not how that works, right? We, you better have done a whole mess of crap for me before I'm going to call in that favor. 
That's just not that's just not how it goes, right? You got to make those deposits over time. You got to earn them. I will say this, and this is an important piece to remember and a little contradictory. If you're asking for help, if you're letting people have the opportunity to help you, you are, in fact, doing them a favor. Giving someone the opportunity to help is still a gift. And it is such because it enacts some universal laws. So the universal laws that tie to relationship economy, excuse me, relationship capital or networking in general, law of generosity and the law of reciprocity. I'm not going to go into what those mean right now, but they're, they're worth looking up. They're worth a, they're worth a Google. So law of reciprocity and law of generosity, very valuable to understand, very valuable to use. We're going to talk a little bit about the idea of networking online and how you can get significantly better at that, which is perfect timing because I would have been standing in front of a group of people in Detroit, according to how this thing was set up when I was asked back in February. And now I have to network with you virtually because that's the world that we live in today and potentially for the foreseeable future. So, Here's my best advice. When I look at social networking, I can see how to do that on Facebook. I can see it on Instagram. I can see it on Twitter. I can see it on LinkedIn. And I can see it on about 37 other sites that I don't want to get into, even YouTube, right? You can network on YouTube. So how do you do it and how do you do it right without spreading yourself too thin? I can't believe I forgot Snapchat. Oh, my daughter's going to be so mad. Anyway, how do you do it without spreading yourself too thin? Number one, you pick two platforms, just two. While it's okay to be on all the different sites, you don't have time and energy most likely to do whatever you're supposed to be doing and be ever present on those sites. So get really good at those two. Know what those sites are, right? LinkedIn is great if you're in the business-to-business space and can be fine if you're in the business-consumer space. Facebook is probably less good for B2B, but superb for B2C. Instagram's fantastic if you have a highly visual business, but a little tougher if you're just doing consulting and you can't really show the goods, right? You can tell some written stories, but that's probably not as easy unless your target audience is a little bit younger, right? If you're trying to go after a 25-year-old crowd, then maybe Instagram's the right place. Going after a 60-year-old crowd, Instagram's horrible. So it comes down to knowing those audiences, knowing what you're trying to get them to do and understand how those platforms work. I talk here about the idea of making introductions. Whenever possible, tag people that make sense, right? Not just tagging people to tag people because that's gross because it's about giving you more exposure. You want to tag people in a way that gives them more exposure, right? Think about what it is that you can do for others. And this last point I have here called follow the hits, right? So for me, I have a four-point social media content plan. Those four points are the hits. Sometimes I arrange those letters differently and they say this. Other times I arrange them differently and they say something else. I like the last one best, but today it's hits. So the hits, humor, right? What do you think is funny? Share that stuff. You don't have to share it all day, every day. But if you share something that you think is funny weekly, that's going to give some people some insight into who you are and how you think and, you know, what you're about. And people love funny. Number two is inspiration. What is it that motivates you or better yet? What is it that inspires you? What kind of quotations do you like that make you feel better? Right. What have you created? Share those. The third one is truth. What is your truth? That's where you can talk about your company or talk about your product or talk about why you got into your business. It's the stuff that's actually true for you, right? So that's the stuff that's authentic and that people can really, really resonate with. And the last one is story selling, or it could be storytelling, but it's probably story selling. And that's where you let people know about the work you do without 
buy my stuff, buy my stuff, buy my stuff. It's like you say, you know, I've got a client here in West Bloomfield, PKIG. They're an insurance company and I work with their leadership team and their sales team. And we run into some challenges about how to get better. And we have conversations about improving communications and creating more transparency and doing good work and just positive communications and how important those things are because they're an amazing company and they want to be even more amazing. And so it's kind of story selling. You talk about them and what you do without saying, hey, buy my stuff, buy my stuff. So those are the hits. Online networking is going to be where it's at. Listen, these Zoom calls that people are getting tired of are not going anywhere anytime soon. If you would like, I've got some notes on how to be better at virtual networking. I've also got five blog posts that tie into this that I would be happy to share with you. I'm going to share my email address at the end of this presentation. Just write uh, me an email with a subject line, six posts, six posts, and I'll share those with you. And it'll be fun, maybe. It'll be fun for me. I don't know if it'll be fun for you. It'll be fun for you. I'm just kidding. All right. We're kind of coming into the home stretch here. There's a couple of more slides, but I want to make sure that you understand this because this is where most networking falls flat. Most people fail miserably at the follow-up. And this is the most important part and some of the easiest stuff to do if you have a system for how to do it. So... When I meet someone at a networking event, I always make sure to have interesting conversation with them. And what I mean by interesting is something that's going to stick out, something that's going to be like the pink elephant in the room, right? Maybe it's a joke. Maybe it's a laugh we shared, or maybe it's about uh, a person that we both know, but something that's going to be a memory trigger. So when I go back and I follow up with them, I say, Something the effect of, hey, you know what? We met at a Motor City Connect meeting. We had a conversation about dudes and pink ties and whether or not ties should be worn to networking events. And we laughed a little bit about it and agreed that no, ties shouldn't be worn anywhere. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not a tie guy. What can I tell you? Um, so, we talk a little bit about that, right? So those are the first two notes on here, where we met, Motor City Connect meeting, what we talked about, whether ties should be uh, used at networking events. The third thing is what can we do together? Well, I would really like to get back together with you to talk about your sales team and how we might be able to improve their networking. Could we possibly have a phone call, a Zoom meeting? Could I swing by the office? Should we grab a coffee? Maybe we want to go out for lunch, perhaps a golf outing. You know, there's like seven different ways that we can meet next time. Listen, for people that are just meeting for the first time, I always suggest it be a 15-minute phone call. There's no reason to get all dolled up, to hop in the car, to drive across town, to go grab a coffee with somebody for 30 minutes when it takes you an hour and a half to accomplish that. That's dumb. Grab a cup of coffee in your living room or at your office, sit down and make a phone call. That means you can talk to six people in the same amount of time. That makes more sense. Whatever it is, got to tell people why you want to get together and then how to get together and then suggest two times right and we could have that call next tuesday at 10 a.m or next wednesday at 1 p.m do either of those work for you put it out there give them something to respond to that works for your calendar and that's how you start now the beauty of this follow-up system is I don't care whether you use the phone and leave this as a voicemail or you send this as an email or you send it as a LinkedIn note or a Facebook message or a text or smoke signals. It doesn't really matter as long as you get this information out within 72 hours of meeting somebody, you're golden. Now, why 72 hours? Well, because in most instances, it's fresh enough that people won't forget. Um, and that's the big answer, right? It's not necessarily too soon. Although people that message me the same day, I like I don't put a star by their name, but I, re I recognize it. That's important. 
if you're like me and you've met a bunch of people and some people you haven't followed up with within 72 hours, two weeks later is way better than not following up at all. So don't forget to follow up. Shh, computer. All right, so there you go, the follow-up. I want to talk about this little concept that I call after you networking because it's one of my all-time favorites. Here's what happens. When you meet somebody, and this is the reason that many people forget names, when you meet somebody, you're so focused on making a good and first impression that we forget uh, we forget our manners a little bit, to be candid. We spend so much time. How am I going to sound smart? How am I going to look cool? How am I going to be remembered? How am I going to be this? You know what? The single best way to make a good first impression is to honor the person you're with by listening to them, to, by listening to their story, by understanding who they are and what they're about. The more you can let them talk, the better. I said earlier that if we met for 10 minutes, I'd let you talk for eight and a half and you'd walk away thinking I was a fantastic conversationalist. True story. Now, here's the thing. You want to let them talk. You want to get that information out of them. You want to make as many connection points as humanly possible. The beauty of this is when it's your turn to speak, a couple things happen. Either one, they stay fully engaged or and if they do then you have their attention and even better you know how to relate your world to theirs because you've got the touch points you've got the common ground so you can speak in a language that's going to make more sense to them than just flailing stuff wildly hoping it sticks that's the beautiful thing of this the other beautiful thing of this is it's entirely possible that you're talking to someone that's a little not quite as polite as you, who's not going to give you the attention or afford you the, the honor that you afforded them. And if you find that you're telling them about you and who you are and what you do, and they're not paying attention or they're blowing you off, you know in that instant that you don't have to worry about networking with them in the future. And that's a gorgeous thing. Right, So you get to find out who those people are in that moment. This is why I tell all of my clients how to do after you networking because it's a tremendous time saver. It's a great way to bond with people and it's a great way to ferret out your network long term, right? Because if you know someone's going to be a jerk in that moment, they were going to be a jerk five weeks from now, five months from now, five years from now. Not letting them in your network is an amazing thing. So practice after you networking. I'm going to give you three things that you can change today that's going to make you a better networker. Number one, First and foremost, get to the point, right? Ain't nobody got time for that. And I don't even care what that is anymore, right? It doesn't even matter. It, we live in a hyper-attention deficit society. I don't know if that's going to change anytime soon. We've got to get quicker. We've got to know what it is we want, and we've got to be real clear about it, right? And that bleeds into number two. So number one is be intentional and get to the point, right? So you got to know what that point is. Number two is ask. It's a mighty big world. We've all got a lot to do, and it all becomes a lot easier if there are more people involved in our mission. The more people we can enroll into what we're doing, the easier it gets. But it doesn't happen unless you ask. We can't just expect people to be mind readers. They're not. Tell people what you need. And then finally, make helping other people a priority. I, I got off the phone with a lady named Berta from uh, just outside of Miami, near Fort Lauderdale, I guess, down in Broward County in Florida today. And she's an amazing connector. And she and I talked for like 45 minutes. And by the time she was done, we were done with that conversation. She had a list of like seven people that she wanted to connect me to just based on things I was saying. I wasn't asking for any connections. But she makes helping other people a priority. I have a stated goal of helping three people every day 
right? And I've had that goal for 15 years and I do it most every day. Some days I help 47 people and, you know, I take a couple of days off, but that's the way it goes. But make helping others a priority. Position that as part of your life. Use your great listening skills to hear when somebody needs help and be ready to offer the help they need. It's an amazing, amazing thing. And I dropped this little contact info in here. Um, again, I've got a handful of my greatest hits posts, blog posts that I was putting together for Entrepreneur Magazine today. And I decided that I should put them together in a way that I could send them to you too. So if you were to email me bean at trybean.com, I would send you a handful of links for you to check out. I'd also invite you to visit my website at trybean.com. I know that we're going to have uh, a little Q&A, which should be mildly entertaining. So I'm ready to open up for that. Um, trybean.com. I'm super worried that the presentation didn't even get viewed. So I'm going to repeat my website, trybean.com. And my email is bean, B-E-A-N at trybean.com, T-R-Y-B-E-A-N.com, trybean. Like give bean a try, not three of me. All right. I'm excited. I'm going to stop the sharing of screen, I think. And I'm going to sit here right now and look at you and maybe some of you are looking at me i don't even know here's a q a as the session wraps campus arrows very great job so right Thank now you. we're still opening up our live for any campus arrows that have questions so if you have any questions please drop them down in the chat all right we don't have any just yet but we are waiting we are waiting we are i waiting. like it Ooh, <laughs> i like it hey juliana where in the world are you can i ask that well, I am in Dallas, Texas. Dallas, that's what's up. Is it super hot in Dallas today? It is. It is. Like All it. right. Is there anything that you want to say as a wrap up while we wait for if they have any questions come in? Uh, I hope that people found value in this. I hope that people have the opportunity to get better connected because I think what I really like most about networking is that philosophically it, it aligns with the ideas of being better to one another. Uh, you can't be a good networker without being a good human. And I would love it if we were surrounded by super good humans doing super good things for each other. That would make me smile. Great. So we do have one question. So um, how how did you become really great at networking? How did you uh, start? <laughs> I appreciate that question. Um, I got I got introduced to the idea of networking in my first real sales job back in 1995. I was selling computer software training and I just got, I got good at it because I got it. It was about helping other people and helping other people be better. And that's kind of who I am at the core of my being. I like having fun and I like helping other people. And so through practicing, through going to weekly networking events for a few years, through starting my own networking organization 15 years ago, just studying it, learning from a guy named Bob Berg, uh, who wrote a book called The Go-Giver and Endless Referrals and Winning Without Intimidation and just watching other people, it's just like a passion, right? It's a, it's a great way to serve people and it just resonated with me. I love that question. I'll well, thank you for asking. Yeah. So what would be your best advice for somebody who's a little bit more on the shy side? A little bit on the shy side, you know, it's uh, number one, go with somebody you like, right? Take a friend. I call it a networking wingman in my book because we're a lot less likely to disappoint somebody else than we are to disappoint ourselves. Networking happens at weird times, first thing in the morning, end of the day. So it's always best if you have a, a someone that you can go with and they can be a touch point during the event. You can go in and check in with them. And you can you can make sure that they're um, they're doing okay and that you're doing okay. It's like a little uh, like taking your whoopee, <laughs> your little blankie with you. That's good. All right, and we have another question, sort of similar on the vein of what we just talked about. But what are your tips for overcoming the fear of networking? 
um, practice, right? Start by start by practice. Number two is start by looking at it not as what can you get from networking, but what can you give to networking? If you have a little higher calling or a little higher mission about it, it becomes a lot easier to to feel better about making the time to do it. So that's that's an idea for sure. Yeah, yeah. And what, is there anybody that has been your networking wingman in the past? Um, I actually do networking wingman as a service, so I end up being other people's networking wingman more than they do. But if I was gonna, if I was gonna shout anybody out in that space, it would be Keith Stonehouse in the Detroit area here. Super good guy, runs a really cool group too. Yeah. So, last question: Who is the best at networking that you've met, or the best networking experience that you've had? Hmm. I I think Tonya Aka is uh, somebody that, again, here in the Detroit area, just outside of Flint, actually, she's been with BNI for a number of years. She's run uh, a lot of networking training, and she's just super intuitive and really, really gets it. Um, and it's for me, it's about it's about that right balance. It's about being able to confidently ask for what you need, but always being willing to help others get what they're looking for, too, because I think that's what becomes necessary. All right, great. Well, that looks like all the time we have and all the questions that we have. But if you have any more closing remarks, I'll let you make those and then we'll sign out here. Yeah, you know, I love it. I love this idea. I love this event. Um, I really think networking is going to be part of the future of work. And I'm writing some essays on that for a client of mine, HireAssemble.com that uh, I think might be of interest to folks here, right? The, the millennials are changing the way we work, right? The gig economy is upon us. So I would love to invite you to come follow me on linkedin.com. Uh, my name is Terry Bean in the Detroit area, and you'll see a lot of that content coming out through there in the near future. And I'd love to hear how it resonates with you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Terry. And then thank you to our sponsors of Campus Party Digital Edition USA. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Owning and operating a business is the American dream. That is, until HR issues like payroll and taxes, benefits administration, workers' compensation, and regulatory compliance lead to sleepless nights and reduced profits. Keeping focus on the core business and finding the right partners to help with ancillary functions like HR administration is why more than 500 companies across the country turn to Tryon Solutions. Tryon relieves the stress and burden of HR administration, so companies small to large can stay focused on why they went into business in the first place. Tryon Size provides client employees access to better benefits and HR services available usually to only large corporations, all while taking employer risk and regulatory strain off client backs. Tryon can help you attract and retain top talent, mitigate risk, and stabilize costs. Check it out at RelyOnTryon.com.